The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Karen Campbell. I'm the Assistant Director for the National Adult Protective Services Association, and I'm very happy to welcome you all to today's webinar, which is hosted by the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center. So, Thanks everyone for being here. Um, today's webinar topic is called how to successfully manage an APS program with a remote workforce insight from experienced administrators. And before getting into introducing the speakers and some of the housekeeping issues, I'm going to hand it over to Andy from the APS TARC for a moment. Thank you, Karen, very much. Um, welcome to the webinar, everyone. Um, I'm Andy Capehart with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. I'm the uh, Programmatic Technical Assistance Lead for our project. Um, before we get started, a quick disclaimer. Uh, the Adult Protective Services uh, Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRM Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Um, so a quick note about our APS TARC. We're here to help APS programs in any way that we can. Just reach out to us. Contact info will be displayed at the end of the webinar. We work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. And we'd like to make a quick plug for our peer-to-peer -peer calls. We have three of these calls each month for APS workers, APS supervisors, and APS administrators, respectively. You can see the schedule on your screen here. Um, if you'd like to register for these calls, just visit our webpage and click on the peer support link for some details. You can also reach out to us by email, and you'll see that email at the end of the webinar. And then lastly, we encourage you to take a look at our APS and COVID-19 page. It contains some resource information, uh, a federal brief addressing personal safety, continuity of operations, and some other things. We also have a summary of state program responses to the pandemic. So um, we definitely encourage you to reach out to us there. And you can download today's slides under the handout section of your GoToWebinar control panel where you can find this link. Or just Google APS TARC, T-A-R-C. Um, and then click on the COVID-19 link at the top of the page. So I will now turn things back over to Karen. All right, thanks, Andy. So some quick housekeeping things. Um, this session is being recorded and it will be posted online at a later date on the APS TARGS website. Um, everyone is muted, all the attendees are muted. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to write them into that questions box as you can see up on the screen. Um, that little screenshot, you should have a little control panel that popped up on the right of your screen where you can access the questions box. And if you write those in, we'll see them. Questions will be read um, at, at various points throughout the presentation for presenters to address. Um, and as Andy noted, the handouts will be available within that panel as well to download during the presentation. Next slide, please. Um, and we have a quick poll to get a good idea of who's in the audience. So, Andy, if you wouldn't mind launching that poll. I will do that right now. Um, Thank you. So, everyone should have this question on their screen right now. Which of the following do you identify the most with? Adult Protective Services Professional, other social services professional, medical, legal professional, or other? And you can click directly on your screen. Um, and, and vote just by clicking on the category that corresponds to you the best. We'll keep this open for just a little bit longer and then we'll share the responses with everyone. Looks like the results are coming in right now. And we'll give it just a few more seconds for folks to again, click on your screen and you can vote and let us know which of these you identify the closest with. Open it up for about five more seconds. So I'm going to close that poll out now and share the results with everybody. It looks like our audience is overwhelmingly um, adult protective services professionals at 86%, 9% other social services professional, and then we have 4% who were just considered other in general. So thank you for um, participating in that poll for us so we know what our audience looks like. It's like everybody is overwhelmingly um, an APS professional. So we'll go back to our slides now. Great, thank you. Um, and then would you mind going to the next slide? 
Thanks. Sure. So our speakers today, um, we have a panel of folks who are going to be speaking to this topic. We have Achilles Cerrone, who serves as the APS Program Director for the City and County of San Francisco. Michael Hagenlock, who is the APS Bureau Chief De for the Department of Public Health and Human Services. Um, in Montana. And then we have Kazali Wool, who is the Associate Commissioner for the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services. And the panel will be moderated by Carl Urban, who is the Research Manager with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. So without further ado, I will hand it off to you, Carl. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, one of the consequences of the current COVID pandemic that we're going through is that basically all of the APS programs around the country had to go to a remote worker model. Uh, in my experience, this was probably a real culture shock for some of the programs. Uh, I was with the Texas APS program when we implemented remote work, uh, and I saw this culture shock firsthand. Some managers are comfortable with it, some are not. For those that are not, the reality is that they're gonna to have to implement it anyway. And so what we wanna do in today's webinar is to make everyone comfortable with the concept of remote work, give you some ideas on how you can successfully manage your program. There are definitely some pitfalls to avoid, but also a lot of positive potential consequences. And we wanna to try to talk about both. So our format today is going to be a series of questions with brief round table answers. What we wanna to try to be is, is sharp and succinct and giving you information according to all of the questions that we have outlined. I may make a follow-up comment or may ask a clarifying question um, as we go along. It's gonna be my role to try to keep this moving and keep us on time. We have basically divided what we're doing into three sections today. The first section is kind of a background section. Why did you do it? How did you do it? The second section is a performance section. How do you, this is that critical question of how do you ensure performance uh, among your employees when you don't see them every day? And then the third section is kind of the consequences section. What are your big takeaways? What we plan to do is to pause for questions after each of these sections. So we'll go through like three questions first, pause for questions from the audience, uh, talk about that big performance thing, pause, ask for questions, and then at the end, we will pause for questions. Uh, just note today's webinar is an hour and a half. Uh, and so we added some extra time to our usual webinar format because of all of the stuff we wanna try to get through. Um, final thing I'll say is I doubt we will answer all of your questions. Um, we will try to capture all of them. To do that, we would appreciate it if you would use the chat box to enter your questions and Karen will be monitoring them and she'll be asking them when we get to each of those pause places in our process today. Uh, so please use the chat box to send us your questions. Uh, we do have some follow-up activities in mind related to helping you support your remote workers. Uh, we want to see how today's webinar goes, see what the issues are that are raised before we commit to exactly how we're going to follow up, but we do plan to have some follow-up activities. And with that introduction, uh, let's get going. And to do so, we have one other quick poll. And so our question that we want to know from you is, what is your biggest concern with implementation of remote workers? Is it providing in infrastructure support, such as equipment? Is it a potential decline in the quality of your casework? Is it maintaining high performance levels in general, getting your workload taken care of it? And then finally, is it a concern with client confidentiality? Andy, launch the poll, my man. Thank you. Hi, you're quite welcome. I have just launched that. It should pop up on your screen, just like the poll we did a minute ago. Um, click on the screen and let us know um, what you, uh, what's your biggest concern with the implementation of remote workers out of the available options. We'll leave this up for just a little bit. We'll give folks the opportunity to vote. Um, leave it up for just a few more seconds. 
All right, in about five seconds, I'll close the poll out. So just click on the screen directly if you would like to vote, and then we will display the options. I'm gonna close that out now. And share the results with everybody. Um, it looks like number two was the largest at a potential decline in quality of casework, followed by maintaining high performance levels, then followed by providing infrastructure support, such as equipment, and then at a low 3%, maintaining client confidentiality are the results. All right, thank you. That is very helpful uh, to our speakers to know kind of how to gear their remarks as we go forward. So uh, the first section of questions kind of deals with context and is focused on the why and how of implementing uh, remote casework. So we are gonna run through these pretty quickly for you. And the first question is, next slide please, uh, to please provide a brief description of your program, discuss when and why you implemented remote casework. Uh, and we will start at the county level and ask Mr. Achilles to go first. Hi, this is Achilles Ron. Thank you, Carl. So our program, I, well, we call it a mobile work program in San Francisco for APS workers and partial telecommuting for the APS supervisors. Uh, we began we contemplating this back in 2016 um, due to an increasing uh, number of reports, increasing workload for the APS workers. Also, many of them um, did commute for at least an average of about 110 minutes per day. Um, in addition to that, the stressors of APS work um, or, or um, performance in two critical areas for the APS mandate in California were in the 70th percentile, 80th percentile. So we saw this as an opportunity to uh, become more efficient and, and help staff be more resilient to increase efficiencies. So what we ended up doing, <clears throat> we created a voluntary mobile work program based on performance that it is maintained by the APS workers where they have the technology that they need, they sign an agreement, uh, there's a communication structure, uh, we have a hoteling station in the office, so in between visits they can stop by, do some work, um, and they have what, what they need to um, work uh, anywhere they choose, such as their home, you know, a coffee shop, you name it. Um, so that, that's when we started our pilot in 2016 uh, with about 13 workers. Then in about 2018, we did a 18-month um, survey and assessment to see where we were. And we saw some savings. We found that APS mobile workers had saved about 46,000 miles and $31,000 uh, just by doing mobile work. And by that time, we had about 24 mobile workers. Uh, most participants reported that mobile work had improved their work and life balance. Uh, we had vacated 17 cubicles and we basically used it as a performance management tool. Also, our compliance uh, improved substantially to 94% and recently to about uh, 98 to 99%. All right. Michael, why did you guys implement telework? Well, thank you, Carl. Uh, it, the one thing to understand is that Montana is very large in, in land mass. We're about the fourth largest uh, state in the country, but our population is just over a million people. Uh, Montana Adult Protective Service, we investigate all allegations of abuse, neglect, and exploitation of individuals that are 18 to 59, as well as those individuals over 60. When we open up an investigation, it doesn't matter where the person lives, whether it's in a private home, nursing home, uh, assisted living, or group home. Um, we uh, started with the uh, remote working about a little over two years ago. And then over the last year, we increased the ability to about 70% of our staff. And then of course, with the uh, COVID-19 issue that came about, uh, we actually moved 100% of our staff, including our intake folks to remote work. Uh, we implemented it because it was turned that 
uh, most of the time, all of our staff are out in the field anyways. They were not actually utilizing their office. They were out in the field. So by getting them all the equipment that they need, one of the things that we found, and, and Achilles kind of touched on it, was the savings, um, not only for the agency itself, but the workers themselves. And the one thing that our workers have told us, if you can imagine here in Montana during our winter time, they spend a whole lot less time trying to warm up cars in the winter to get to work, let alone have to warm up a state car to go see somebody. So what we found is that we became more efficient. We spent less time driving and more time working with the individuals and there was less distractions from the office environment. So that's why we started and that's where we're at today. Thank you. So Kez, I don't imagine warming up cars was one of your reasons, but why did you guys go to remote work? So in Texas, um, much like Montana, we have a large geographical area, um, and we also have a, a large population. So we have around 550 caseworkers to cover 254 counties, um, and that includes some of the most rural areas in the country, all the way to some of the largest metropolitan areas in the country. Uh, as to why we implemented mobile workforce, um, like so many times in government, unfortunately, it stemmed from us getting into trouble. So back in uh, 2005, uh, we had some poor case outcomes. And as a result, uh, we made a lot of changes to our program. And one of the interesting ones was we were all of a sudden issued mobile equipment. We sat around for about a year with these new portable devices, uh, tablet PCs, and we really didn't know what to do with them. And one day we realized that they're not just small desktop computers. And so we started trying to think about, okay, how do we improve our casework and improve our efficiency? And we developed what we called the as-you-go approach, the concept being to do the work where the work is, or as uh, one, of our, uh, or one of our training managers likes to say, work is not a place you go, it's something you do. And so we rolled that out, and then we realized that uh, we had forgotten a key element, and that was the fact that managers needed to know how to manage in a mobile environment. And so we rolled out in 2009, managing a mobile workforce to train all of our managers on what the expectations were from a management perspective. And finally, by 2010, we officially instituted uh, the concept of an, a, a, a complete mobile workforce. And that included some space changes, the, the hoteling that uh, Achilles was referring to, we were able to reduce our, our footprint across the state as our leases came up. Um, and so since 2010, we have been 100% mobile for frontline caseworkers. And with managers and other folks, we've maintained that office model. Okay, so let's, let's go to the next question and, and think about, as you rolled this out, I am sure that you guys ran into some obstacles uh, when you're dealing with any sort of bureaucracy, dealing with organizational culture is obviously a critical issue. Uh, so I'm curious, what were the obstacles that you had to overcome as you rolled out? And we'll go with Michael first this time. Okay, yeah, some of the obstacles that uh, we had to overcome here in Montana, uh, big one was the uh, change in the office culture. Um, the culture that we have to be in an office, that you have to have the desk and chair and, and, and all those kind of pieces and, and have all the bodies around you. So the culture change was a huge issue. Um, one of the other things that we ran into was unplugging at the end of each day. Um, some of the collaboration with each other in the office, uh, which uh, brought up the challenge of some loneliness. Um, as there's no longer the water cooler uh, confessionals or the gossip stations. So again, with that culture, when you think about the culture changes, um, there are distractions from home life, um, such as the spouses and children's barking dogs, the neighbors, you name it, um, that we get used to. Um, we also found that we have to learn how to separate our work from our home life. Um, some of the stresses that come there. For some folks, the going to work was the way to get away from that stress in life. Uh, we had to shift the method of the ability of the supervisors to have physical contact with staff at a moment's notice um, and learn how to use their systems and be able to maintain the quality control as well as the contact. 
some of the other obstacles is uh, setting up the routines to create the culture of the human side. One of the things that we uh, want to keep in mind is that even though we're working remotely, still remember that people have birthdays and anniversaries and there's other celebrations. Um, we need to acknowledge the uh, uh, persons and, and keep that kind of contact going. So those are some of our obstacles and, and uh, culture changes. Uh, Achilles, what about you? Uh, for us in San Francisco, at, at the beginning, because of our structure, APS is a program within the Department of Disability and Aging Services, and it's one of three programs under an agency, the Human Service Agency, and IT and Human Resources are under that agency that services the, the three departments. So one challenge was that our proposal would increase the workload of the IT and HR as we were piloting this and organizing it. Um, and also the fear of, of precedent. You know, many, many of you indicated, what about the quality of work and, and the time that uh, uh, people will, will, will have to service the clients, our clients. So once you begin with one program, then other programs will go, well, what about us? And what about us? And what if you can't control this? <laughs> It, it was a matter of, of, of um, and my predecessor, Jill Nielsen, who at the time was the director of Little Protective Services, very skillfully looked into the long range um, goals and the wins for the agency, especially for HR, such as the possibility of increased employee morale, retention, and a win with labor. So it, it was uh, really a, a series of repetitive efforts to gain uh, support to give these a try. That was one of the biggest challenges. Um, once the pilot began to, to happen, um, we also tried to move from just presentism, um, as opposed just to looking at compliance or, or performance. You are here working, we see you. Now we need to move at, well, what are the outcomes of your cases? Uh, how can we coach you? The traditional progressive discipline when someone was not um, performing as expected did not really work anymore. So we, we have to shift into a more coaching culture and also with the idea to retain your mobile work status, uh, that privilege you, you need to perform. So those were some of the, the changes and that many workers who, uh, out of our 45 workers, now we had uh, 38 mobile workers by 2019. Uh, many of them had a difficult time leaving their cubicle. Uh, so, but they, per our policy and procedure, within 30 days, they would have to leave the cubicle. So those were some of the challenges that we found. Okay, and I'm sure we'll talk about performance a little bit more in a minute. Ken. Ken, you're on mute. I gotta remember to unmute myself, thank you. Um, having done mobile casework for over a decade now, we have seen a, a litany of challenges and obstacles, and some will pop up again over time if you're not careful and you don't keep a, keep a close eye on them. I think the first thing, though, that we identified with the organizational culture was management. Um, caseworkers were able to adapt and adjust to the new environment, and they actually enjoyed the flexibility it gave them. Uh, the managers, not so much. They struggled with, how do I know my caseworkers are working? How do I know that they're performing and doing their job? Um, and so that was a real struggle for them. And we ended up spending a significant amount of time and energy to try to bring our managers up to speed on how they can do their work in this new environment. Um, I think Michael's point about the human element, the fact that um, our caseworkers can become get to feel that they are disconnected, that they don't have the support, and all of the pieces that you have to put in place in order to address that feeling. Um, and then, oddly enough, one of the biggest obstacles that we've had is the concept of connectivity. Mobile work is great, um, but if you're trying to enter documentation as you're doing the contact, if you don't have connection, if you don't have a cellular connection, it's very difficult to do. So we had to work through that from an IT perspective and develop an offline um, tool so that our staff could document offline as well as directly online. 
Um, and those were some of the some of the major obstacles that we encountered. All right, and we'll talk about support services in just a second. So, Kez, let's stay with you. Next slide, please. Um, so, let's talk a little bit about change management, how you went about addressing some of these obstacles. I uh, want to hit on four topics just with real quick, brief responses. So, Kez, we'll start with you. What did you guys do in terms of communication with your staff? How did you create buy-in uh, out in the field? So, in order to... Um, we, we had a, the good fortune of having time to put this into place. So we were able to develop a communication plan that involved getting a group of staff together from all different levels of the organization to plan what the expectations would be, what does the training need to look like, and that we had the time to roll that out and give presentations and trainings across the entire state. Uh, so that was critical for us. Um, I don't think that many folks have that luxury right now during the COVID. However, when the COVID is over, I think, or at least when it recedes, I think it's important to make sure that you're approaching it from a long-term strategic perspective. Um, one of the key policy changes that we made was at the beginning, we moved to what we call the as-you-go documentation model. We essentially told caseworkers that they will document as close to the event as possible. Uh, we told them to do it while it was happening, but uh, in order to monitor that, we put in policy that they would document their contacts either the same day or the next day from the time that they were made. Uh, the key equipment, obviously, we needed um, laptops or tablets, and we also issued smartphones to all of our staff. Um, and as far as community partners, I think the biggest issue there, there weren't a lot of concerns, but one of the biggest issues was phone numbers. Uh, make sure that people are checking their answering machines, and if they're if they're providing a number, they should provide their mobile number if they're never going to be in the office. Otherwise, you end up with a lot of no no callbacks. Okay, that is great. And so let's go to Michael next. Can you talk a little bit about change management, in particular in terms of communication policy, equipment, and partners? Sure. You know, so one of the first things that we found with an, in the communication side of things is establish a sense of trust. I think trust is very important that we have a sense of trust between the supervisors and the APS investigators, the APS professionals out there. Um, and with that, um, learning and understanding the different tools that we have. Um, much like Kez spoke about, all of our staff in Montana now have smartphones. Um, they don't even have a desk phone. Everyone has a smartphone and that's the only number that they have um, to learn. And some of them we actually had to uh, teach them how to text and, and do some video conferencing on their cell phones as well as the computers and whatnot. Um, so we had to build that up and, and hold regular meetings and communication between the supervisors and the other APS investigators out there. But then as well as to make sure that everyone else understands how to contact us, our website, our phone number, our intake office to verify any of our staff out there that customers might have uh, questions about uh, an investigator that shows up to their office. Um, policy changes. Um, overall, we didn't have a huge change in our policy other than how to properly use the systems, um, making sure that people are uh, logging on to their computers on their phones. Um, so the supervisors know we utilize Teams as one of our main one now that we have is Teams. Uh, we have Skype as well. And so you're able to tell when folks are uh, on their systems and whatnot, as well as with the uh, phones, they can actually check in as they're going to different cases so they can get to the victim's house, let's say, and they can on their phone check in that I'm here. It's a safety feature as well, and when they're done. So when you come to some of the key equipment, um, all these little pieces and components, um, it's the smartphone, it's having the portable laptops or uh, tablets, those kinds of things there. And then making sure, of course, that the uh, systems are set up. Uh, we use a VPN, a secure system, um, that keeps everything safe and, and a couple of different passwords to get through there. Um, 
making sure that everything is wire wireless capable. That's a, a big thing and the hotspot on the phone so the computers can hook to the cell phones as well. Um, and the other piece that we made sure that all of our staff have for equipment is actually a, uh, a small printer that's a, a scan copier and they're only about 80 bucks as well as Faxcom, uh, a fax system. So there again, they don't have to go to a fax machine, they can fax right from their system. So we made everything electronic and working through there. And as far as the outreach and the community partners, um, we ask all the supervisor and investigators to make contact, either by emails or phone, in person. Don't stop those, keep the meetings going, keep talking to them, you know, coordinate with them and, and uh, make a lot of stops, invite them to go over and have a cup of coffee and talk with folks. So that, that's how we keep the communication open all the way around. Okay, great. Achilles. Yes, for, for us, <coughs> um, back in when we started the pilot, um, formally in, uh, uh, well, basically in July, 2016, we formed four groups with representatives from each one of our seven units back then. Uh, to discuss staff engagement, best practices in supervision and management, what is needed, like IT issues, space. And they met monthly, um, pretty much almost until the, the mobile work program became formal in July of 2017. And as a result, we, uh, we had a substantial amount of, of policy and procedure for mobile work that had been discussed with our human resources, with labor relations, with the union, et cetera. And we were able to um, get these policies and procedures in a manner that were meeting the needs of management and of staff. We also had a project manager that would be a kind of like a neutral uh, person, uh, not necessarily uh, leaning with management or, or, or with staff, but that would lead everyone in the project so that staff would feel free and open to share ideas on how mobile work would work for them. Uh, in terms of key equipment uh, for our hotel in station, we, we had to have the, the basic setup, such as chargers and, and adjustable chairs and you name it. Um, the most important part was our mobility kits. So pretty much we issued uh, laptops and chargers, smartphones with internet access, hotspot, monitor, and a wireless keyboard with mouse, laptop stand, and portable power charger. So the basics that they need to succeed on that. And pretty much like Montana, uh, we still required our workers to come to the office for the all staff meetings, for the multidisciplinary team meetings, and a lot of the field work that is required, which is being out in the community, uh, that didn't change. So, um, Although now with COVID-19, we're doing a lot of this much more virtually, uh, but prior to that, uh, when we formalized the program, we still had the expectations of, of this in-person involvement. We wanted to increase time in the field and with clients and less time in the office. So Achilles, did you, did you change any aspect of your policy? Um, well, some aspects with respect to, for instance, communication, how soon people needed to get back to the supervisor when the supervisor would call or text, uh, issues with respect to emails, for example, or um, because we were transitioning to become paperless, we had to determine that um, we staff couldn't carry any confidential information into the field. So we set up cabinets here for staff and, and we had to figure out ways of really become more of, of a paperless program. Uh, and, and we began that process. And the performance standards, you know, they, we just highlighted them in order to maintain the privilege of, of mobile work. So there were some uh, emphasizing some aspects of current policy and procedure, and, but most importantly, leaning on communication and effectiveness of communication. Okay. So it, it, in the response to this question, um, the, the one thing I heard I'd like to know a little bit more about is, Kev, can you talk a little bit more about what as you go documentation means? Sure. Um, what, what we realized, we had policy in place that required that when people made a contact or had an interaction with a client or a collateral or a alleged perpetrator, 
they had up to seven days to enter that documentation. So the uh, those of you who have worked in that environment know that what would tend to happen is people would do their work and then when it was time to close the case, they would sit down and document the entire case. Uh, we wanted to shift that documentation to make it a part of the work. Basically, yes, visiting clients is your job, but the other part of your job is documenting that visit and we need it to happen as close to simultaneously as possible. And it was a big shift, especially for some of our more tenured staff who were used to doing it the old way. Um, but what it's done for us, it's provided at any point, if I get a complaint or if a legislator calls me with a concern about a case, I can open that case and I can be confident that it is going to be current, up to date, and I can see when the last time we saw that client, what that interaction was like, what was documented that was said, uh, and it's been a it's been a real boon from a management perspective as well as just from a data integrity perspective. So does as you go mean literally that as you go, or is it, it literally that literal? Yeah, it, it means document it as you go, but we did because of the, the fact that we have to measure these things so that we can um, have some accountability. Uh, and the reality is some places are not safe to sit down and document in the client's home. Uh, we turned it into a policy requirement of doing it within the, on the same day or the next day. Okay, same day, next day. All right, last question for this section, and we're probably running a little bit behind. Uh, so next slide is, what are the most critical support services, IT, fiscal, legal, uh, that you needed from your agency? And if y'all could, and you've mentioned this as you have answered the other questions. So if you could just briefly say what you think the most critical support service is without a lot of explanation, that would be great. And we'll go Achilles first. Okay, so uh, two, well, everything is important, but I would say the most important is IT support. That is critical. Uh, the equipment has to work. Staff need to have the right equipment. It has to work. The, the support the help desk, troubleshooting problems, uh, that can really make it a success or give you a lot of headaches. So critical. And the IT. Yeah, yeah the, the IT, absolutely. And there's cost associated with, with, with everything and, and, and having a, some, someone designated project manager to implement this is worth your while. Okay, Michael. Yeah, I think uh, there's really two big points that you're looking here with the IT, absolutely critical. It's understand that they understand the environment and the culture and how we're working and what's going on and the importance to keep these systems up and operating for the safety and well-being of our uh, victims out there, as well as our legal department to understand that they're not going to find us sitting in an office, that we are out remotely and we can be contacted immediately. And that's the nice thing with the smartphones and all that is that immediacy to be able to be in contact with folks. Yes. Um, I think the IT piece is critical. A worker that doesn't have working IT equipment is not able to do their job. And so you, we have to have hot swaps available so that within a matter of hours, we can get anyone up and running. Um, it's also important to remember that your, uh, your break and loss uh, numbers are going to go up. Uh, people are carrying equipment around with them. It will get stolen, it will get dropped, and it will get broken. And so you have to be prepared for that. Okay. I understand the questions are rolling in. Um, and so we've got a few minutes for questions on this section. And so I will turn it over to Karen, who has the hard jobs of parsing through those for a few minutes of questions and answers. All right. Thanks, Carl, and thanks, everybody. And um, we do have quite a few questions. So I went through um, and tried to summarize uh, a couple of themes that I saw. One of uh, the big questions or a question I've gotten multiple times is related to the training of new workers and onboarding. Um, we've gotten quite a few inquiries asking how how training new workers is managed and kind of how successful is that? What does it look like? Michael, you want to go first? 
Sure. Um, you know, that's a great question in, in utilizing and learning how to use some of the training methods, um, and especially in today's world with COVID-19. Uh, I think it's important, number one, is to get the new person in, make sure they're getting the equipment and learn how to use that equipment and how to contact IT and, and those kind of things. And then getting them right into your training and setting up a mentor with them. Um, to help walk them through. Um, so the training and the onboarding, they go together, work it quickly, but at the same time, get them the tools, make sure they know how to use the tools. Achilles. Yeah, so for us, because, we, you know, um, the the workers, the new workers would still come into the office, go do their training, uh that that we have set up scheduled and do the shadowing and so forth so um they would begin here in the office and until they pass probation then they would be eligible for mobile work so um and also or supervising staff or trainers uh doing partial telecommuting we, we still have staff in the office to maintain that training environment um for them and once they're able to perform and, and pass probation and so forth, then they can become mobile workers. Now with COVID-19, it's, it's a little bit different, but normally that's how we would go. And Kev. Yeah, so um, the first thing we did was make sure that the mobility concept and the mobility expectations were incorporated into all new worker and then subsequently new manager trainings. Uh, we've also, to keep that human support element, we have developed a uh, mentoring program so that people are assigned a mentor. They have someone that they can have real contact with on a daily basis and uh, we've also made it clear to supervisors that we have expectations for them to hold ongoing uh, meetings with new employees um, and some of those need to be in person face to face okay karen next question all right one moment karen. yes sorry i it was muted um we had a question did staff or managers formally grieve or make formal union complaints against remote slash mobile work? We will start with Achilles and probably just stay with Achilles because I doubt Montana or Texas has unions. Hi, right, so <laughs> no, interestingly, be, because it was um, desired, you, you have to think that in San Francisco, the cost of living is very high. So a lot of people had moved or live in neighboring counties and some of them mega commute you know it's it, it's it's quite a bit so the the mobile work pretty much became desirable the concerns that we dealt with and we um through our um employee labor relations and meeting with the union was in finalizing the policy and procedure with respect to um if what does um, non-compliance mean and, and poor performance and how do we calculate it and what if someone is on leave does that count and so there's a lot of minutiae and details that i think because staff participated in this process through the work groups initially a lot of these questions during the pilot phase and the pilot phase was important because it allowed us to try a lot of things without a lot of consult every time with the union um, but the staff were engaged. So by the time we were finalizing the pilot and we had learned a lot of do's and don'ts and what works, what doesn't, and, and how to coach instead of just, uh, um, you know, reprimand, I think that helped in, in, in addressing any concerns from the union. And, and literally, when we finalized our policies and procedures, um, it was, you know, a thoughtful process where, where, you know, it's so difficult to think about everything and until you have those discussions, the, then the information that meets the interests of, of management, the interests of, of the union and staff, you know, it just became a dialogue. But I think this was wanted on both sides, so there was no, no impediment in that end of grieving it and then the union 
preventing us from moving forward with this effort. So let me let me flip the question just a little bit and ask Kez and Michael, what was the biggest pushback from staff on this? What was their biggest concern, the biggest pushback? Uh, so Michael. It, oh, go ahead, Kez. Well, I was gonna say in Texas, the the majority of our caseworkers love the mobile model. Uh, the biggest pushback was when we started messing with space and reducing uh, footprints. Um, that was not a, a well received by everyone. A lot of people were okay with it, but we did get some pushback. People wanted their own space, they wanted their own cubicle, uh, and that was no longer possible. So you went to a model in which people didn't have an assigned office for the docking station in essence? Sure, we, we put in carols and, and reduced to about two thirds. Um, so two thirds uh, space for the full amount of employees. Okay. Michael, biggest pushback for staff? Uh, the biggest pushback for staff, I think I'd have to just model what Kez just said, was we reduce our footprint in office space. Montana does have a union and we had a formal grievance against us, but once we pointed out that oh. in actuality, the uh, worker themselves were saving money because they didn't, we provide a, a state vehicle that we allow them to take to their homes. And so now they don't even have to drive their own vehicles. And once we showed them that, and the fact is that they didn't have to work directly from their house. They could if they wished to, or they could go anywhere in their community to work. And in fact, a lot of the libraries, uh, county buildings, whatnot, were very welcoming to our staff. Once we got that and got things rolling, um, they were much easier. But the biggest pushback was definitely the loss of the personal office space where they could put all the personal effects in the office. Okay. That's that's very interesting because I've heard already some programs that said, why didn't we think of this before? And so that's a big, and we can save money through office space. So that's, if y'all are listening out there, I think that's something you really got to take into consideration. Uh, let's move on to the next section. Um, and then this is sort of the, the heart of the discussion today uh, is this question about how do you manage performance? That's clearly what we heard in our poll at the beginning is how do you ensure that you continue to have uh, quality casework done? And we are gonna let folks stretch out a little bit um, on this response. And so um, Achilles, you wanna go first and talk about how you manage staff performance in this type of environment? Yes, uh, so basically to, for, for the mobile worker to, for us to capture the data, there the, are the two critical uh, key performance indicators that um, staff have to comply with on a, on a timely manner to remain um, as a mobile worker. Um, and th that that is easier. Uh, that is easy to do, you know, to, to see someone face to face within the time allotted, and to do a risk assessment in a timely manner and to document that. Um, but some workers were having increasing caseloads, so you 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 may be compliant enough to remain a mobile worker and benefit from mobile work, uh, but if your caseload is increasing, well, that is not. Um, the 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 performance that we we seek in workers so what we ended up doing we um had expectations for our supervisors to work with our staff so that they would have no more than 25 cases per month uh, like ongoing um to help their staff close their cases to shadow their staff twice a year um and we also implemented our quality assurance quality improvement program and part of that is that a supervisor from a different unit would review cases of another unit and, and look for the specific elements in terms of quality. Um, we also uh, changed the way in which we documented our findings and a standardized approach for our risk assessments. So we brought in a lot of tools to help us standardize how we document and, and process our casework and the expectations of supervisors with respect with, with their uh, their staff. And and uh, would, Kez. I'm so, go ahead, Kelly. So 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 I would like just to to add that um, back in the day we had about thirty five ongoing cases per worker. 
Uh, now we're down to about 17 ongoing cases per world. There's other factors that, that come into play, but I think the, this is one of the contributing factors. Of yes, managing staff performance. Yeah, I think it's it's key that, that culture change has to happen. Um, and you have to have trust, as Michael mentioned much earlier, uh, you have to trust your people, but you also have to trust your data. And in order to do that, you need uh, robust and easily accessible data that everyone at every level can access. Every caseworker in Texas knows what their stats are, and so do their supervisors and their program administrators all the way up the chain. Um, we also have developed a series of target zones for key metrics so that we've identified what we believe healthy casework looks like or successful casework looks like and then we hold our staff accountable to meeting those metrics and we give them some wiggle room because we all know that cases are different and caseloads are different but at the same time we know what healthy looks like or what we believe healthy looks like and we hold them accountable to that um, we also have implemented uh, have for a long time a quality assurance program that looks at uh, different individual caseworker cases and scores those for quality. So we're not just looking at are they doing things timely and are they doing things um, as they're supposed to, it's also are they doing them well. Uh, and we're providing feedback to all of our staff on a monthly basis on their quality as well as their quantity. Michael. Yeah, and, and I, you know, can support both what uh, Achilles and, and Kez have just stated. And so the other side of that coin is that, uh, you know, we have to understand, as I said, the culture has changed a bit here. And as supervisors, we need to adjust our thinking and our approach and make sure we're utilizing the tools we do have and, and make sure you're fully using all those tools. Adapt and overcome the obstacles. Be solution focused. Set up times to meet with each of your staff members, set up group meetings, not just to point out problems or issues, but to check in and the self-care, maybe telling some funny stories, et cetera, sharing information. Again, that human side. Uh, when a call with the staff, be on the call. Don't be multitasking. This is another way of managing your staff, not only their performance, but getting them engaged. You as the supervisor needs to be in engaged and be in the moment. Um, team meetings, individual meetings, these all must have a purpose. Have an agenda, stick to it. Don't get sidetracked out there. Stay focused on what's going on and keep your staff in the loop. Do not just focus on, on your own stuff personally, what you have to get done and what you need, but think about what their needs are and make sure that we're addressing those. Um, if you have a data system for case progress, milestones, any red flags, absolutely pay attention to those and, and make sure those are being met. And try as much as possible to keep all meetings as they were just done be done being uh, on video. When you're using a lot of the teleworking stuff, sometimes you get a little relaxed. Still have the meeting, still have that contact with them. Just be clear. And one thing also is be very clear with your expectation, what you expect the professionals to be doing out there and the training that they're supposed to be having. Be very clear and, and handle things as normal as possible as if they were sitting in that office with you. So all, all three of you mentioned data. Uh, you all mentioned quality assurance processes. Um, how do you tie the two together? How do you tie data together with quality assurance? What's the link between them? Uh, we'll go Kez first, I guess. Well, I think for the for the individual caseworker, you talk about those two things together. Um, we have seen uh, people who can tick every box and they will show up green on every single data element, but we see that their quality is abysmal. They're not doing the job that we need them to do. And we've also seen people who are great caseworkers providing excellent services, but they're they're not meeting their, their requirements as far as their data elements. And so you have to have the conversation about both of those things together. Uh, and it has to be an ongoing, regular conversation uh, with every employee. Every supervisor needs to meet at least once a month, if not more, with their caseworkers to talk about both of those elements. Okay, uh, Michael. 
Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't say any more, really. Uh, I know here in Montana, um, our supervisors meet with the investigators out there uh, minimally about once a week, even if it's just for a short to check in on it. And, and when it comes time to uh, close those cases, you know, read those summaries, read those pieces on there that are real key pieces. You know, like Kez says, you can check all the boxes, but if you don't have it properly documented, don't let them close it. And that's the one thing we push back on is if it's not done right and it's not clear and articulated well, send it back. It doesn't take but one or two and they'll they'll fall in line and make sure all that documentation. But yeah, absolutely, data and the, the uh, assurance on it, you have to look at both sides. And Achilles. Yeah. So I, for us, it's the, the, the key has been standardization, um, improving our policy and procedure manual, have it inaccessible, um, what is the expectation of writing, how to write, uh, how to write a finding, how to conduct a risk assessment, a needs assessment, what needs to be there. And I think standardization has helped having the supervisors um, not uh, an excessive number of employees to supervise, shadowing them, meeting with their one-on-ones, having unit meetings, reviewing those cases. Um, and I would say that when, when you have something standardized, it really helps you to see inefficiencies or variations or unacceptable work. So that has been of help to us as we have also implement um, outcomes and how we study or indicators or services or outcomes in APS work in San Francisco. So uh, that's, that's all very interesting. Uh, uh, the, I think the theme that I hear in what y'all are saying is that the need for high quality management practices is enhanced when you go to a remote workforce where you might be lazy or lackadaisical um, when it's easier for you to do. But those things such as user data, tying it to quality assurance, standardizing what you're doing, making sure your meetings are done professionally, all those high quality management processes become just that much more important uh, when you're dealing with the mobile environment. Um, so the last question in this section is, is a pretty simple question. Um, uh, so we go to the next slide. And that's OK. So that's how you manage high performance, what has actually happened for you guys? What's been the impact on your program? What's been the negative consequences? What have been the positive consequences on what you are doing as a result of all of this? And Kez, you want to go first? Talk about both questions, please. Sure. I, I think from a very simple perspective, the biggest negative consequence that we've seen over the years is that feeling of isolation and lack of support, um, a decline in the sense of team. Um, and we have spent a lot, of, a, a lot of time working with our managers and our caseworkers on how to uh, shore that up. How do we make sure that we're having real human contact and interaction and that everyone feels like they're getting the support uh, that they need? Um, on the positive side, I think that there are actually two major improvements. One is retention has increased. Um, flexibility and the ability to do your work from where you are uh, means that you have more time. As Michael mentioned, you're, you're reducing your commute potentially. Uh, you're able to be more flexible in your hours worked. Um, and that has really, really helped our staff stay with us because they see the benefit. Uh, the other piece is, honestly, when you have disasters, whether it's hurricanes or floods, which we tend to have a lot of in Texas, or it's something like COVID-19, we have the ability to continue to do our work, and that has been a real lifesaver in, in a lot of different uh, scenarios. So how do you know it's helped you with retention? We know because we've spoken to staff, um, and we've had many, many of our staff tell us, the reason I stay and this was before we got pay raises for everyone, by the way. But they said the reason that I stay is because um, I have this flexibility, and there's no other job where I could get I could get this type of flexibility. Okay, that's very interesting. Achilles, positive negative consequences. All right. So so the negatives. Um, what the 18 month uh, report revealed when when uh, staff were surveyed, some of the responses really revolved around 
no one to go to lunch with or or venting or sharing those types of events with someone especially if you are new um working uh, a lot more on the computer and that loss of uh camaraderie um so those are some of the biggest impacts that we saw on on that survey uh positive consequences just like Kath mentioned uh with COVID-19 compared to other programs in our city we were able to adapt fairly quickly because the vast majority of our staff were already partially telecommuting or mobile workers so we had designed that business process and culture so we were able to adapt fairly quickly and continue servicing our, our, our clients and, and being responsive. Um, other uh, outcomes out of that uh, was a reduce of absenteeism from staff, reduce employee commute, time and cost, and people really appreciated that. And, and we also heard similar comments as Texas did that, you know, they, they employee retention, having the flexibility, having the ability to organize their work in a manner that um, is most uh, effective and efficient for the workers and for program. Okay, Michael. Yeah, I think uh, what the biggest negative, um, it's the reduction in the personal contact that people were used to. That's probably was the biggest feedback we got at the beginning. The other side was the, uh, the setting the boundaries between the personal life and work life um, for the staff as well as the supervisors and reminding folks you know work within your scheduled time not outside of that and don't contact the workers if they're off um, it becomes too easy when they're teleworking so that was one of the negatives there is, is really that boundary between personal and and work life as far as a positive consequence uh, if you will um, what the staff have reported back to us as well is that they're feeling more freedom and flexibility in what they can do and move about. And we've even done the same thing with their scheduling with children and all that other. Um, they're instead of being there every morning at eight o'clock, they might be someone that's working 10 to six or different variations. And as long as their supervisor knows and is approved of it, they got more flexibility. So they're not stuck to what the building will allow them to do. And as of course I mentioned at the beginning of all of this, um, one of the big comments our staff has made about it is when, during our winter times, they don't have to clean off the snow of two cars. <laughs> um, a couple of follow-up questions. Uh, uh, Y'all talked about the loss of team and that loss of sense of being camaraderie ship. What have you specifically done to address that? And Achilles, we'll start with you. So prior to, to COVID-19, um, the requirement that for our monthly APS, all staff that work would, uh, staff would come in person, all the APS workers um, and supervisors would come monthly for our meetings, um, that they would come to their unit meetings and their one-on-ones um, and when we saw staff coming, you know, we, we saw a, a sense of joy of seeing each other and the whole group and taking pictures and also celebrating, you know, like during the holiday season. Uh, we also have a yearly APS retreat. And so finding opportunities to have staff back so that we don't lose that face-to-face -face contact uh, became critical. During COVID-19, we tried to do something similar like a Hawaiian you know, luau via Zoom so that people can see each other face to face and have an opportunity of having just more of human conversations, not only work, 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 work. Um, and, and I think people need that. Yes, what have you done? Um, I, I think Achilles hit it on the head. You have to create opportunities for people to interact and for people to have meaningful conversations about both about work and about personal issues and that's something that we've done with once again monthly required monthly unit meetings uh face-to-face -face conversations between the supervisor and their employee um, and just any opportunity that we have uh, breakfast tacos on every third wednesday anything we can do to give people an opportunity to interact in person michael anything to add 
No, I, I think they covered it all. I'd just be repeating what they said. It is okay. about that personal interaction and getting together. Uh, Kez and Achilles, Michael mentioned that they moved to more flexible work hours. Do y'all have more flexible work hours as a result of this policy? We, we do in Texas. Uh, we're willing to work with staff, and that's, once again, one of the reasons why people really like the job. If they need to take a two-hour lunch break to go do a uh, visit with their kids' school, they can do that as long as they make up for it later on during the day. So it's been, it's been very helpful. Achilles? Yeah, uh, similar to Texas, so people may begin early in the morning and then early in the day or vice versa. Um, as long as uh, staff do not go over the um, 80 hours per the uh, biweekly or 40 hours, so that there's some constraints that we have to observe, but there's flexibility during the work week and in terms of the begin and end time of the work. And we offer alternative work schedule where someone may work uh, 80 hours at a pay period and have every other day off, which could be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. Okay. Uh, so that is all the, the, the pre questions for this section. Karen, I will turn it over to you for questions related to these topics. All right, great. Thank you, Carl. So we had a few questions come in related to um, uh, related to a topic that was addressed <coughs> around accountability, but specifically asking about HR issues and how those are addressed. Um, so kind of focusing on what tools are utilized to hold people accountable and what HR support and the HR process looks like if you get to a point where you do need to involve them. Uh, we'll start with Michael on this one. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's always these issues, you know, about accountability. Are they working? Are they following their schedule, doing what they're supposed to do? And it's one thing to look at documentation. One of the tools we definitely use is the Outlook calendar. Um, here in Montana, the uh, staff are required to put all their casework, if you will, in other words, the report ID of that particular case they're working on, on their calendar. Um, where they anticipate they're going to have these things. If it changes, they need to move it to whatever time frame that uh, they moved it to or canceled it, make those kind of notes and, and keep track of it that way. Um, and again, like I say, with the cell phones, um, the reporting in and out, so we have tracking of that. Um, in addition to that, um, you got like the Teams, and we're on Teams, Microsoft Teams now, and you can track a lot of your conversations on there. So all of that helps create some of that documentation for knowing where folks are at. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still about trust. It's about, you know, folks getting their job done. But we're utilizing tools such as Outlook and Teams to uh, monitor and build a document where folks are at and that they're, in fact, on the job. Achilles. So, so for so since most of the APS workers are um, mobile workers, uh, it, it is really an incentive for many reasons. Um, so, someone who is not performing as expected uh, due to no compliance, we can return them to the office where they will receive more support, more assistance, more coaching. Uh, standardization helps a lot to see where exactly the person is not uh, performing uh, well. And if they're unable to perform, um, then they may lose their privilege. And until they demonstrate at least two consecutive months of, of uh, performance, um, then they would have another opportunity to become mobile. We only offer becoming mobile twice a year in the spring and in the fall. Um, so if you really lose that privilege and you're unable to perform, then you may have to wait quite a bit of time before you're able to get back uh, into mobile work. I think that generally as an incentive, this has worked coaching and also using standardization through the coaching process has really helped a lot um, and, and it's been very infrequent where we had to go to a more rigorous performance improvement plan. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So um, I just wanna clarify, in Texas, we don't consider mobile casework a privilege. It It is the job and so, 
uh, we, we don't ground people, um, but we do hold them accountable. And I think what we found is that when you have the rich data and you have the quality assurance to back that up, and you also have all these supports that are put in place to make sure that people get what they need and they, they get the support that they need to do the job well, um, I think that it's actually improved our ability to hold people accountable to help them develop, and if they can't develop, to help them find a different job. Uh, and so I just interesting you said that because that's what I was going to follow up with. And so I'll follow up with Michael. So San Francisco, it is a privilege. It is not a right. In ex Texas, it is an expectation, and everybody is a mobile caseworker. What about Montana on that pendant, on that? continuum, Michael. Privilege, right, or does it fall? It's the job. It's what we do. It's how we do our job, and that is the expectation. Okay. That's very interesting. Karen, other questions? All right. I have a uh, two-parter that's focused on logistics based on summarizing some questions. Um, the first piece is related to specifically the, the working in a home environment. Um, so do... Do your agencies provide um, mechanisms for scanning, faxing, shredding, um, and, and things like ergonomic equipment or um, a hotspot to create private Wi-Fi in public spaces? Uh, we'll go with Michael first on this one. Yeah, and I, and I can make that a real short answer. The answer is yes. We provide all the equipment that is necessary. Like I said, the uh, smartphones, they have hotspots on them. No, we will not install internet service to their home, but they can utilize <laughs> the hotspots on our phones. Um, any equipment that is necessary for them to do their job at home, just like it was at the office, we'll make sure they have it, and that includes printer scanners and fax. And we, we pick up these HP printer fax scans for about 80 bucks, and and send them to their home. Kez, quick response. Yeah, pretty much the same as Montana. Um, the one interesting thing that I would point out is that we did do a lot of experimenting with purchasing mobile desks yeah. that people could use in their car um, and, and a lot of other items. And what we found was <laughs> not a one size fits all. So be, be wary of purchasing something for everyone. It's better to be flexible and identify the individual's needs and then try to meet those and the killies yeah so for us yeah it, it's similar to uh montana um with the exception that we do not provide like copier machines or or fax machines or shredders for the home um because of the geography of san francisco um people you know that they, they they have at the hotel in station we are now for the most part paperless um, so now the need to really handle paper is minimized substantially um, as we can upload with our city issued phones, documents and so forth and that we use the technology to upload into the case record and so forth. Um, so we provide the technology, we, we train them on watching a video on ergonomics, we have discussions to sign an agreement and some of the reports that we've heard from from people especially during the 18-month assessment is that um many of them filed find themselves ergonomically better when working from home okay um michael or kez he's referred a couple of times to the 18-month assessment have y'all ever done a formal assessment of impact i i think our our assessment of impact has been ongoing i mean the the impact has been ongoing uh, we implemented and we've been monitoring our our performance throughout and we haven't seen a dip so or at least a dip related directly to the implementation of mobile casework so no we have not done anything Michael. more formal than that okay Michael. yeah i think as formal as we got is there are feedback from our staff we've not sat down and, and created some kind of matrix for it it's the fact that the staff when we started out that weren't mobile wanted to know when they get to go mobile and now that everyone's 100 percent mobile we asked who would want to return to the office and we only had two out of 45 response that they would like to be at least go to an office to work so there's our evaluation yeah that's pretty good all right, so we're going to shift to a couple of real short and succinct feedback kind of questions, sort of summary questions. And so if you'll go to the next slide, 
Um, so just real quickly, uh, maybe top two things in each of these categories. What strengths were you able to engage? What weaknesses did you have to overcome? Opportunities did you capitalize on? What was your biggest threat? And you don't even have to answer all four if you want to focus in on just one or two of those um, and give real short, sharp answers. And we will go Kez first. Yeah, I think the strengths that we had in the first place where we had robust and accessible data that we could use, and we also had a great flexible IT support and, and uh, training teams that were willing to step into this with us. Um, we talked about the other ones, but I think one thing to, to think about, one of the threats is empty offices don't look good, uh, especially when other people don't understand what you're doing. And so it, it's taken mm -hmm. us some time to get other managers and other programs to recognize that we do our work differently um, and not to look look askance at us because nobody's ever in the office. And to, like Michael said, let them know, if you call, we will answer. Uh, we are working. So that was an interesting uh, an interesting change. Achilles, what, which of these SWAT things really stand out to you as being important? Um, so instead of strength, staff were ready for mobile work. Uh, staff wanted to participate in the pilot. Weaknesses, we had not developed our paperless plan when we started, so that was a little bit rocky. Um, and then there was a lot of doubt from management to staff and staff, do they trust me as management trust me? So we had to like really get over that and give it a shot. Um, our database supports uh, being paperless, we have a lot of support from IT. Our biggest threat, I guess, you know, is, is if APS would if our workers would have less contact with with their clients, um, and that was a real, real concern. But as we find out um, after assessment and what we see frequently is that our staff are spending more time with, with clients, at least prior to COVID-19. <laughs> okay, Michael. Yeah, looking at this, you know, and I can just bring it down to a nutshell, the strengths that we have in there is the efficiency of our, our staff and what we're doing now. Uh, a weakness um, probably was the uh, feeling of disorganized, um, an opportunity to capitalize on, the cost effectiveness for everybody, not only the uh, Adult Protective Services program itself, but also for the employee. And then what were the biggest threats? I think one of the biggest threats not mentioned at this point, because I don't want to repeat everybody else, um, is the perception of other state workers working from home on a taxpayer dollar, seeing them at the house mm -hmm. all the time or a state car. So that would probably be the, the biggest threat there. Okay, last question. So James Brown. James Brown used to talk about the one. And so my question for you, for all these programs out there that are having to do this on the fly, what is the one thing they need to know to be successful in, with remote casework that you have learned? Most important thing. I'll let y'all choose who goes first. Who wants to go first? Be honest. Be honest. So Michael says to be honest with you. Honest, so that communication, that culture change is really important in terms of honesty. Kez or Achilles? I would say be flexible, and if it doesn't work well, don't give up. Try something different. Okay. And Achilles? Uh, set set a, a structure for communication. That's going to relax your nerves. If, if you have good communication, you will be able to feel comfortable and you know what is going on and what is happening. Okay, good. That's fantastic. Karen, we got about 12 minutes for, whoop, 11 minutes for questions. Where, where do you want to go? All right, great. So um, another summarized question based on a few that came in. Uh, it's related to the logistics of home visits. So there were some questions as to what vehicles folks drive. Do they drive their own cars? Do they have to pick up an agency vehicle? Um, and then there were some questions also about if staff keep paper resources at their home or in their car, kind of do they have a car office um, like to give pamphlets to clients when they're in the homes? Uh, a couple of you have referenced cars already. So Michael, you use, you don't use cars, what you're saying, you use your own? No, in the state car. of Montana, 
Yeah, no, in the state of Montana, um, I've actually have a car procured for our, almost every single person on our staff. They all have a state car that they can use and they get to choose whether they keep it at their home or they leave it at a state or a county office, something in that line. So they uh, all can use uh, a state vehicle. Some opt not to for personal reasons. They just don't like the uh, restriction around using a, a, a state vehicle they want their own and that's perfectly fine and then we pay them the lower the mileage when they choose to use their own vehicle as far as paper resources go um like achilles mentioning we are almost predominantly paperless everything out there for the most part with your cell phone alone with the proper apps on it you can scan everything you can transfer you can fax from your desktop or your uh, phone i mean there's so many things now that we can do electronically that the only thing that we keep really is pamphlets and maybe some backup copies such as uh, body sheets and those normal forms and we actually provide them a little uh, folder they keep everything in and that just stays right in the car achilles well, in, in San Francisco, uh, traffic is an issue, and especially Wasn't you know, absence shelter in place. Uh, so, so staff take a city vehicle that they get. A lot of people commute using uh, public transportation, um, but they get here. They can use a city vehicle, go within the city. But many people use public transportation here within the city just because it's, it's so accessible and it gets you right to where you need to go and sometimes even faster than driving. Yes. So in Texas, the uh, workers use their individual vehicles and submit travel reimbursement. Uh, but there is an expectation that if they're going to be doing over 150 miles in a day that they will use a rental vehicle. Um, and as far as the paper uh, paperwork, we are pretty much paper free with the exception, as Michael mentioned, of a, a few pamphlets that we do provide them with a, basically a file folder that they can store those pamphlets in when they give them out. Achilles, are y'all paper free? Uh, well, for the most part, but, but staff can carry like, like a pamphlet or information within their, their portfolio, whatever they carry with you. Uh, we also provide them with uh, Surface Pros or, or laptops so um, because they're mobile and the concept of mobile is that you can uh, work with your laptop, for example, out of anywhere um, and you know, it is secure, encrypted and all those good things. So they, they do carry a little bit of, of, of uh, paperwork with them with respect to handouts and so forth and their laptop. Okay. Karen, next question or question. All right, the next question um, is another kind of logistical question related to working out in the community. Um, so it was mentioned earlier on, you know, folks can work from libraries, coffee shops, that kind of thing, um, of course, in a, in a non-COVID kind of setting. Um, and there were questions related to maintaining confidentiality while working in a public space related to Wi-Fi concerns. And then there was also a question about are there any devices given out for laptops like reflectors for the screen? Uh, Achilles, you wanna go first? Yeah. Sure, so for San Francisco, we, we, we do provide them with the screen protectors. I, I forgot the name, but you know, you, you cannot see anything at an angle and staff need to take those precautions. Use the hotspot from the city issued phone as opposed to public Wi-Fi and public information. Just use their hotspot. Um, and and if the laptop is stolen or it breaks, uh, no one can get into it because it is um, set up by IT with those protections. Um, so yeah. Uh, Kev. Yeah, we um, first of all provide significant training to our staff on confidentiality and especially in in the public environment. Uh, we do provide some screen protectors, and uh, we also use VPN, and that's with multi-factor uh, identification requirements, and so it's it's fairly secure. Uh, we've had no concerns and no exposure that, that uh, we've been aware of in the past 12 years, so. Okay, Karen, next question. All right, great. Um... The next question, we had a few come in asking if they, if you all saw changes in client outcomes 
when you transition to a mobile workforce or a remote workforce, and if so, what those changes were. Uh, oh, how about kids versus time? Uh... So I don't know that we can say that we've improved outcomes, but I can say that we have not gotten worse outcomes with the mobile work. Um, I do know that, as was mentioned earlier, we find that our caseworkers are able to spend much more time with the clients rather than driving or coming into the office. And so I'm, I'm assuming that that has helped improve some of the outcomes out there. Achilles. Uh, so in terms of that, because um, we began to collect data on, on outcomes in a standardized way after the pilot or way after you, we cannot really compare. But uh, anecdotally, um, we, we receive subpoenas for cases, they have increased, we review cases, and we see a lot of uh, good documentation and work being done, um, discussions with community partners, with, with the hospitals, with CBOs, with other departments within the city, um, and the, the presentations and multidisciplinary teams. So with, with those staff and based also on our 18-1 assessment, um, we, we find that staff are spending more time doing uh, case management and, and to, for us that is very important to, to, for staff to spend time with our clients. Karen, you got one more brief question or should we wrap up? Karen, yeah, we could do we could do one more question. I was just scanning through them to see if there's one that could be quick. There was one um, that I thought could be important to address related to safety concerns. So, were what were some of the biggest safety concerns that you all had um, encountered for staff during the transition, and and how did you work to alleviate those things? Michael. Sure. Uh, you know, as far as con safety concerns and, and doing telework, um, I, I don't believe there is a change in the safety. There's always concerns for safety. And so one of the things that we worked on, and uh, I thank Kez and his team down in Texas that uh, triggered us on this, is the use of their cell phones so they can not only check in at a a particular home or whatever when they get there but also when they leave and so with that app on the or that piece on the phone with the it goes directly into the file of that individual we have a better understanding of timing uh, we constantly talk about safety regardless of the environment that they go into so I, I don't have any change in safety concerns it's always a concern to be safe out there uh, Kev. Yeah, I would completely agree with Michael. It's, it's the same challenges and it's the same, and they're still going into the same homes. And so we did implement safe signal, which allows them to uh, be monitored. And if that safe signal is activated for whatever reason, then law enforcement is contacted immediately. We have a contract that, that does that for us uh, using their cell phones. And Achilles. That was the same. Um, we, we, we pretty much face the same. Um, challenges and issues now within our city or police department uh, we only deal with one police department and if it is APS calling uh, they're supposed to give priority response uh, as opposed to a long wait and so that's been helpful when staff has had to call the, the police uh, now 911 can be via text as well um, so yeah, not, I mean, doesn't really, mobile work doesn't impact the, the safety concerns. Thank you guys very much for your great answers. And I will turn it to Karen and Andy to wrap up. Absolutely, yes, um, I would like to echo that. Thank you all so much for, for being here today and sharing your expertise. Thank you to our audience um, for being so engaged for your participation and questions. Um, as you can see up on your screen now, there's the contact information for the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, as well as a link to their website. If you'd like to reach out or um, look at the other resources that they have there. Um, but otherwise, thank you all again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.